commission. Um, actually, I think uh, it is quite clear uh, uh, on that point what, what the mission is. Um, I just want to break these uh, stereotypes. I just want to get the right and, and the real information to people um, that you can't do what's good for you, what's good for the planet, what's good for like millions of, of animals uh, that are suffering now for us. You can do something that's good for all of that uh, things. And it's one thing, it's, it's not, it's really easy, it feels good, and it's gonna make you um, like just just feel so much better in your own uh, in your own body. So the uh, question is, why shouldn't you do it, right? Is there any any idea of, of not not going vegan? Is there any um, argument for that? I don't see the argument. So um, I really believe in that, and I try to get that information. And my experiences, just just to everyone. Thank you. 
in caring for sanitary animals as well. I think the next people in our sites, if you like, are the farming industry and the food industry that um, really go unchallenged. And I think that's partly because of the attitude of government these days. The Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, I would say, is totally being captured by farming interests. Um, under Caroline Spellman, the last Secretary of State, she used to work as a researcher for the NFU. Uh, the ministers, you had know, Jim Pace, who was a dairy farmer, Richard Benyon, who's the richest MP in Parliament, he's worth about 110 million, but he owns vast swathes of the UK, and he even owns grouse more. Um, now you've got David Heath, the farmer minister, who was a pig farmer. Uh, the minister in the Lords was a horticulturalist. And if you had any other department where it was so much dominated by people that have got a particular one-sided view of what food policy is all about, um, people would soon be sort of saying, well, this is, you know, totally... Um, how can they possibly be impartial on these issues and there's something very wrong about this, but it's, it, it doesn't seem to be challenged in the same way with DEFRA. The um, IPPC, the International Committee on Climate Change, that said that if all families had just one meatless day a year, this would have the same beneficial effect on greenhouse gas emissions as taking one million cars off the road for an entire year. And yet this really isn't talked about very much. The, um, there was the Enough Food If campaign this year, and I actually, it was, it was very worthy, it was meant to be the successor to Make Poverty History. And I was very supportive of it in that they were trying to tackle global hunger and put it, put it on the political agenda. But they had all these reasons why people couldn't afford to feed themselves. And one of them was biofuels. And I, I sort of went to them. So it was all, all groups like Oxfam, all, all the big NGOs that were involved in developing country work and, and poverty reduction. And I went to them and said, why are you talking about biofuels when the figure for the amount of land that is being given up, um, so the deforestation and um, you know, the, the sort of land grabs and so on that's associated with the livestock sector is about eight times as high. So I think it's like the amount of land that's been given over to biofuels is, is something like 100 million, I'm just trying to find it. Yeah, 100 million tonnes of crops were diverted to create biofuels in 2009, which is the last year for which you've got statistics. So that's 100 million tonnes for biofuels. 760 million tonnes of crops were used to feed animals. And yet, it's, so surely that should have been part of their campaign as well. Biofuels is almost like a little bit of a red herring. But you couldn't get them to talk about the fact that the livestock sector is, is, is massively used in our world's resources. It takes... Um, I just whiz through the figures on that. It takes 100 times as much water to produce one kilogram of beef as it does one kilogram of vegetables. It takes 120 calories of energy to produce one calorie of beef protein as opposed to two calories of food energy to produce a single calorie of plant protein. 21 square meters of land to produce one kilogram of beef. Um, yeah, I can go on. And it's just a really inefficient use of the planet's resources in terms of land, in terms of fossil fuel energy, in terms of water. And it's the, you know, the Raj Patel, who's the author of this book called Stuff and Starve, which is really good, he said the amount of grain spent to US livestock would be enough to feed 840 million people on a plant-based diet. And the number of food insecure people in the world is about 850 million. So again, you know, we need to put this on the agenda. scandal. I think that's just the last thing that I'll mention. Um, I think that really, it obviously really worried people when it was revealed to them um, what was actually in the, the meat products that they were eating. And um, when I started looking at it, I, I was absolutely amazed that the figures for what actually is classed as meat is under EU regulations, a product can be called meat if it's if it's got at least 40% of 
anything that comes from an animal. So it, it's things like connective tissue, fat, um, all the scrapings. And I, I've, I actually had quite a few colleagues coming up to me after I spoke to in a debate in Parliament saying that I made them feel incredibly sick and they weren't going to go and have their sausage sandwich in the tea room, which was what they planned to do. Because you actually get these food plants where they're hosing down, every, trying to get every you know, pressure jets, get every last little bit of tissue, slime, scrapings, whatever, off this meat that has then turned into economy burgers. And I think, and this, again, this is something, as I said, for something to be classed as a meat product, 40% of it has got to have some of these sort of disgusting bits and pieces in it. Um, there was talk that the UK government was lobbying to get that reduced to 25%, so God knows what the other 75% would be. Um, what we had in the debate, though, was some very well-meaning Tory MPs standing up and saying people need to learn to value their food more. So they ought to be buying locally sourced organic meat from their local butchers, not the economy range. Which is all very easy to say, but if you're a family that, you know, we've seen half a million people now in the UK relying on food banks because they can't afford to feed their families. The cost of living has absolutely gone through the roof. People are being hit. I'm not going to give you a sort of part of this whole lecture on the impacts of all the cuts and the welfare changes and pay freezes and all that, but we know that people's living standards are really being squeezed. And there's a market research company that said last year 30% of consumers now buy budget ranges as opposed to just one in five back in 2008 because they are so depressed. And if you're somebody that can barely make your money last at the end of the week, and you can buy a pack of eight burgers from Tesco's for one pound. That's what you're going to do to feed your family. You're not going to save up and go to, I, I have no idea how much organic meat in a locally sourced sort of butcher place costs, but you just can't afford to do that. You know, it's, it's, it's a luxury for people. And what I think is really important is that people actually know what is in their food. Um, and that's what the horse meat scandal did, is it really shed a light on, um, and also the way that the supply chains, the fact that these horses were coming from Ireland and there was not going over to Romania, and these products were being made in about five or six different countries. So at no stage of the process did you have an idea of what was being added to the products as well. And I think we really need to keep up the, the pressure on, on that. Um, Lord Haskins, who's a, a farmer and the former chairman of Northern Food, said that he thought there are many other scandals that could come to light. And, um, most recently, I think I was told that there was an issue to do with cats being found in meat products as well. So uh, you could say, I mean, I don't know how many of you are actually vegans, but you could say there's a bit of a, is it, what's it, anthropology or whatever, you know, what, what's, if you're prepared to eat a cow, why, why are you worried about eating a horse or why are you worried about eating a cat or whatever? But the fact is that a lot of people were very worried about that. And we did see quite a rise. I think fries saw a real increase in their uh, product sales, which is obviously good news. A few other things that I've been doing in terms of um, like animal testing, um, I'm hosting an event in Parliament with the Dr. Hadwin Trust to fund in the first ever professorial post for the replacement of animal experiments with other scientific measures. Um, so that's brilliant. So that's at Queen Mary's um, College in the University of London. And it just gives real academic credibility to the, the idea that there is an alternative to testing on animals. The government, again, is... One of, one of the bits of good news we had was cosmetic tests on animals that finally came in in March this year. The government did commit, all the three main political parties committed in 2010, that the next step would be a ban on the testing of household products. And surprise, surprise, this, this government has sort of, well, it, it's gone a bit cold on the idea, it hasn't introduced the ban yet. Now what they're saying is they will introduce a ban on the testing of finished products on animals. But it's not the finished, in this country, the finished products aren't tested on animals, it's the ingredients that are tested. Um, so there's a, there's a campaign that's going on the moment saying you've had three years, you promised to do this, you want everyone to sign up. I think it's the 43 International that behind it. Household products out there that aren't tested on animals. You've got um, brands like MS and Co op, as well as Ecover and the, the other sort of slightly more obscure products. There's absolutely no need to test anything on um, cleaning products on animals. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, how to fuel on the run and uh, how many runners.
pursuing happiness. Now, you can run a mile a day, and that's uh, considered a runner in my book. You don't have to be an ultra marathoner. So we've got a lot of runners in that crowd. I think what I'm going to be talking about today could be applicable to any endurance sport where you have to fuel, hydrate while you are moving your body. So even if you're not a runner or you're not an endurance athlete, professional athlete to be athlete, it's important to pay attention about how you fuel. Those of you who aren't familiar with some of the things that I do, um, I've been running ultra marathons for almost 20 years now. Um, I've run the Western States 100, and I've run that race and won it seven times in a row. It's a race that takes place in Squaw Valley, California, over the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges, down into the American River canyons. Temperatures can reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the best part of that race. You, you literally look forward to 80 miles. I'm going to move around this way so that folks can see. Can everybody see that's over here? Probably. Uh, at mile 80, you get to uh, go through the American River. And even though that water is as cold as can be, melt from basically from snow melt in the mountains, this is what you look forward to. Um, this is the first time I saw daylight. Most people finish this race in the dark or they see daylight the next day. Um, I ran and set a new course record back in 2004 and ran 15 hours, 36 minutes. So to give you an idea, that's nine minute, 22 second pace for 100 miles. And that's 18,000 feet of climbing, 23,000 feet of descent. So not a flat, flat London Hyde Park run by any stretch. Most people, to give you an idea, um, as I mentioned, will be out there for 24 or more hours. In fact, the limit is 30 hours. So in my book, um, people are out there twice as long as me, and they deserve just as much credit. Uh, in 2010, I ran the 24-hour World Championships. Now, running around a circle that's one mile in length did never seem to be something I was interested in, but the mental components of running these races, you literally, um, I, I think it's probably not a harder thing that I've done in my life. Basically doing the same route for 24 hours, seeing how many miles that you can rack up. And that's the whole premise beside, behind a 24-hour race. I set a new American record at that time, which has been since broken, of 165.7 miles. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with 8-minute eight, eight uh, 40 pace, that's essentially doing that six and a half marathons back to back to back to back. Um, that's including bathroom breaks too. Uh, running that over the course of uh, 24 hours in one day. I think this quote kind of sums it up is let food be thy medicine by Hippocrates, um, not the other way around, you know, medicine be thy food, which uh, of course these days everybody. Uh, pops a pill for anything they can take. Um, maybe not here in the UK, but in the US. Uh, pharmaceutical drugs, in fact, we have enough constantly bombarding our television and commercials. Um, people ask for the drugs before their physicians even prescribe them. So I think we need to start looking to food being our medicine. If you notice, I didn't talk a lot about plant-based um, sports nutrition. The reason for that is you never are really eating a steak while you're running or doing aerobic exercise. We have any steak eaters that like to chow down on a steak while they're running or cycling or kind of chow down? Come on, nobody. So this information is applicable whether you're somebody who's a plant-based vegetarian eater or you're somebody who's a carnivore. Um, you don't have to be plant-based, but there's some great plant-based nutrition, sports nutrition books out there. Vegetarian Sports Nutrition, which I wrote the forward for, highly recommended if you want more detail. Um, Becoming Vegan, another great book uh, that has a sports nutrition section. You're starting to see more plant-based specific sports nutrition books out there. Um, but for many years, there just wasn't a lot on the sports nutrition side. Partly because you can use the other books as well. So there are a few specifics out there. Thank you. 
that the young, like the young people in our next generation are our only hope. Everyone, you know, all the other organisations, they focus on sort of everybody, whereas we just want to focus on the youth. There's a lot of people out there who, you know, teenagers especially, who find veganism is often embarrassing, and we, want, we just want to sort of give them that encouragement to speak out for what they believe in, um, and just, you know, kind of just be confident individuals and be proud that they are vegan. Um, I think that our goal in the future is just mainly to become like a, um, a universally recognised um, organisation and to just work with other groups, other companies and stuff like that. So that's what we hope to achieve in the future. The other things that we do on the website, um, one of the most popular things is our celebrity interviews because teenagers especially love celebrities. So um, we try to like get in touch with veggie vegan celebrities, interview them, and we put it on our website and also our mini map, which I'll tell you a bit more about later. Um, some of the people that we've interviewed already have been um, Biff Naked, um, who's a singer, Chanel Ryan, who's a Hollywood actress, um, and also Jonah White, who was very, very big in the um, vegan scene. And our, our most favorite one today is um, Alison Ashley Arm, who's from the Disney Channel. Um, she's actually a teen and a vegan too, and she's actually a member on our website, which obviously is very, very exciting. This is another campaign that we're doing, um, which is a big campaign, and it's our Fueled by Compassion campaign, which is um, basically we got wristbands made, which Laura's going to show you now, which say Fueled by Compassion. Um, and it's our campaign really to encourage young people to once again not be embarrassed about being vegetarian and vegan, and it's something to be proud of. You know, you're making a difference for the animals, it's the most important thing you could possibly do. So, it's so when someone recognises you, you're wearing a wristband and says, What's that wristband? and you can explain what compassion means to you and you know why you're vegetarian or vegan and um, so yeah it's given it's aiming to build the confidence and communication skills in youngsters to tell people why they're vegetarian or vegan. Salamata Eyes are we eyes are on a vegan, we vegan. I and I eat from the earth and leave the animals to give birth. No deaders, no fur, no feathers. When I tell people I don't eat meat, fish, or dairy, then look for me strangely. Then I realize I eat a very wide variety. Listen to Maccabee. Yo, how when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say me not eat no fish, no, no meat now. How when me eat them, I wonder when me yum. When me tell them, say that I'm a vegan, man. How when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say me not eat no fish, no, no meat now. How when me eat them, I wonder when me yum. When me tell them, say that I'm a vegan. When me not eat no meat, no fish, no cheese. Nah, no egg. Nothing with no foot, no eye, no wing, nah, no head. Nothing with no lip, no ears, no toe, nah, no leg. Prep for fruit and vegetables no instead. Ha. Me careful and me choose about what I'm eating. Me medicine, me food, me food is me medicine. When me tell people that me not eat them, they think. They look at me and scratch them chin and start wondering. How when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say me not eat no fish, nah, no meat now. How when me eat them, I wonder when me yum. When me tell them, say that I'm a vegan. How when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say me not eat no fish, nah, no meat now. How when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. Yo, I hear what me eat. Yo. I eat kalalo, aki, sweet potato, yam, banana, and tomato, cabbage, spinach, avocado, chocho, butter, bean, and cocoa, courgette, millet, plantain, rice and peas and pumpkin, mango, dates and guava, chickpeas and cassava, Brussels sprouts and cauliflower, onion, fennel and cucumber, plum, pear and papaya, aubergine and sire, lime, lentils and quinoa, oatmeal bread and oatmeal flour, watercress and okra, tofu and sweet pepper, couscous and carrot, broccoli and coconut, peaches, apples, apricot, breadfruit, jackfruit, sour sap, pistachios, cashews and almonds, walnut, peanut, also vegan, sesame seeds, sunflower, lemon, orange, Pineapple and melon, mango, wheat and garlic, kiwi, corn and turnip, pacho and pomegranate, hijiki and rocket, berries, cherries and strawberries, beetle, grapefruit and celery. You say the meat's not necessary. We tell them, say, how when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say, me no eat no fish, no, no meat now. How when me eat them, I wonder when me yum. When me tell them, say that I'm a vegan man. How when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say, me no eat no fish, no, no meat now. How when me eat them, I wonder when me yum. 
When me tell you, say that I'm a vegan. Hey, look how me big and me say, look how me strong. Some people can't believe that me a vegetarian. If you want a healthy body, check the real Rasta man. Cause Rasta man, we tell you about the right nutrition. Me get me calcium, me sodium, me get potassium. Me get me zinc, me get me iron and me magnesium. Instead of yam the fish, me yam what the fish yam. Like the kelp and Irish must that grow in the ocean. Me get me proteins and me minerals, me get me calories. The vitamins A, the B, the C, the D, the E, the F, the G. Essential fatty acid like the omega tree. Me get me fiber and me carbohydrates in my body. Don't forget your water, drink a few glass a day. The toxins in your body just flush them away. Some of the things you eat stop in your body and decay. When it come to food, I don't play. We tell them, say, I when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say, me eat no fish, no, no meat now. I when me eat them, I wonder when me yum. When me tell them, say, that I'm a vegan, man. I when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say, me eat no fish, no, no meat now. I when me eat them, I wonder when me yum. When me tell them, say, that I'm a vegan. A lot of people would have stopped eating the meat If they had to kill the animal before they could have eat Look on the way the animal then get treat Unsanitary condition where some of them keep it We're supposed to eat the meat, we would have sharp teeth You wouldn't need a knife and a fork, you know, see You can't eat it dry, you have to cook it complete And put on vegetable seasoning to make it taste sweet How when me eat them, I wonder when me eat When me tell them, say me no eat no fish, no, no meat now How when me eat them, I wonder when me yum When me tell them, say that I'm a vegan Man, I when me eat them, I wonder when me eat. When me tell them, say me no eat no fish, no, no meat now. I when me eat them, I wonder when me yum. When me tell them, say that I'm a hey, it's up to you. You can eat what you want to. You can be a vegetarian and be healthy too. There's a lot of choice around, many foods around you. But just remember, some more I forget to tell you. The nectarines and tangerines and clementines and guanabana, lighty oats and ginger, kale and spinach, mung beans, warm pasta, 